So this is our Middle East uh, culture and customs conversation. Um, this idea was born out of um, our New York State uh, TESOL session um, from the, the annual conference, right? When we all got together and talked about what kinds of different things that we might want to do for this year. Um, so um, our Buffalo Rochester Regional Co-Chairs really took off on that idea. And we decided to focus um, first on the Middle East um, because we have many students from the Middle East um, here in the Buffalo and Rochester region. So did I miss anything? <laughs> I don't think right. so, no. And I now I think Nicole, you're, you're up. Yeah. Here. So hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Miller. I am a teacher in Buffalo Public Schools. I work at Lafayette International High School with 100% L population. Um, I would like to now introduce my co-chairs for the Buffalo Rochester region for Nice TESOL. Um, we have Jamie Scripps from Rush Henrietta Central School District. Hello. We, we have Jenna Colrick, um, supervisor, director for Buffalo Public School Multilingual Department. Joanna Fograssi, um, Buffalo Public School Multilingual Coach. Hi, everyone. Kate Kleiber, Genesee Community College professor. Hello, everyone. Miss Shauna Sweet, Midwest Arburn. She's also the VP for Finance on the Executive Board. Hello. And, and Tanya Rosado Berenger, Mid State Arburn Director of Regions. Is Tanya here? She might be popping in. Um, but I also wanted to just acknowledge, uh, I see that we have Monica Baker, our New York State TESOL president here. Um, she's from the Hudson Valley region. And we also have uh, Ching Ching Lin. Uh, Ching Ching, I see you're on. She's our president elect and, and we're glad to have them here as well. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over now to Joanna. So as we all get settled in and ready for this really awesome panel discussion, um, we just wanted to uh, center everyone and, um, you know, remind everyone to be present. Um, there's so many distractions, especially since this is remote. Many of us are probably at home. Some of us might have children or pets or other things to attend to. So we just try, um, we ask that you try your best to just unplug from the other distractions at home from your cell phone, from anything else, um, to be present uh, and participate as much as you can and uh, avoid, you know, sidebars with, I mean, I guess family members now, cause you're not gonna be talking to other people like you would at a in-person PD um, and just participate. You know, we're here to learn. And um, the more that you can get out of this, the more hopefully you can share and pass on so that we can continue to improve the educational circumstances for all of our L and MEL students. So enjoy. Thanks, Joanna. And now I am going to turn it around um, and over to Shauna. So I just wanted to share some guidelines for Netiquette since uh, we're on and um, you know we're working as a group from all over the state. Um, first of all, I want to say we are recording this session um, because we like to share on the New York State TESOL um, YouTube page. So uh, we will be recording. If you don't want to be on camera, you can uh, certainly turn your camera off. Um, we're going to ask that everyone remains on mute for the session, um, but we do encourage you to ask questions in the chat. We have people who are monitoring the chat. Um, so we'll try to get to some of the um, questions from participants at the end. And just, you know, keeping in mind to respect diversity. Um, we all come from different backgrounds and um, our panelists are all from different places as well. So it's just really important to keep an open mind as we um, open our minds to learn. So that's it. thank you. One more thing, um, if you're not a member of New York State TESOL and you've never been, this is the time to join because in the month of February, you can get a membership for just $15. Um, the code is on the screen, February 15. And um, what else was I gonna say? That would help you to be eligible for CTLE uh, PD credits when you attend any of the nice TESOL PDs. And there's other perks as well, but that's one of the biggest ones, so thanks. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. So we are now going to introduce our panel members. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel member. Um, Arwa, is it okay if we start with you? Oh, you are muted. Thank you. Okay. My name is Arwa Nasser. I was born and raised in the United States. My parents are from Yemen. They only spoke the Arabic language and no English. Um, I was born and raised in the United States. So I'm 46 years old and I've been here 46 years. One interesting fact about myself that I am so proud of that not many uh, children who are born and raised in the United States that whose parents are immigrants have the ability to say that I have memorized seven, 70 out of the 114 chapters in the Quran. So that's something I'm very excited about. And that's something that is very interesting to me. Excellent. Thank you. On to our next panelist. Durgan, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Durgan. Um, I am originally from Iraq. I was born there. I was raised in Jordan. And uh, I came to the U.S. right after I finished eighth grade. Um, and I came to Buffalo Public School uh, to Grover Cleveland, if you're familiar with the, our schools in Buffalo. Um, I, uh, let's see, where am I from? Languages I speak, I speak Arabic. Um, I actually am super passionate about the language of Arabic. I, uh, I teach it, I speak it, I read. I love to do that when I'm free. Um, and uh, let's see how long I've lived in the US. It's been 14 years and some change now. And one interesting fact about me, uh, I am a uh, calligrapher and a poet uh, in Arabic. So, yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. Sure. Hagar, you are next. Um, my name's Hagar Hafez. Um, I'm originally from Egypt and my family is also from Egypt. I speak Arabic and French. Um, I've been in the US uh, for six years now or five-ish, almost six years. Um, an interesting fact about me, not really sure, but I also do calligraphy like Durgam. This is actually one of his pieces and those two are mine. <laughs> um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And Dalshad. Hello, my name is Dalshad Aziz. Um, from, I was born and raised in Syria. I speak uh, four languages. My first language is Kurdish. My second is Arabic. And I also speak a little bit Turkish. And my fourth um, is English. Um, how long have I li lived in the United States? I have been living in the United States for five years. Um, one, in one interesting thing about me, I am athletic. I also could learn a lot of languages really, fa like really fast in a short time or period. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of our panelists for being here today. Uh, we are going to move right along into our questions. And please feel free also to ask questions in the chat as our conversation does evolve. We will be taking questions from the chat a little later on. Yeah, Dilshad, would it be... Um, is it possible for you to maybe turn up your microphone uh, when you answer? That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, for letting us know that. Okay, so our first question, and um, this is in no particular order. Also, uh, you may not hear from all of our um, panelists for every question, but I'm sure as the conversation does evolve, you'll learn even more than what the question is actually asking. So our first question is, what is one major difference between school in your home country and school in the U.S.? 
so one of the major differences um, in schooling in, for example, Yemen, as opposed to um, the United States, is that uh, education is for everyone, but not everyone attends. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Who else would like to chime in on this one? I can actually take a stab at this one. Great. So one of the major um, things that differentiates schools back uh, in my home country, and when I say home country, I'm really thinking of Jordan because that's at least most of my memory of schools, um, I suppose compared to the US, is that uh, we have this uh, saying um, that the entire school system culturally, mentally, um, revolves around. And the saying says, and it translates to the teacher has almost become a prophet of God. And therefore, respecting your teacher, um, as far as hierarchy goes, it's almost more important than respecting your parents. So when I am in a classroom in my home country, um, I'm looking up at that teacher, not as the person who's teaching me as much as I am looking up to that person who is a role model, person I must respect and I adore and all of these uh, other things that go beyond the role of a teacher. So coming to the U.S., it was much of a cultural shock for me um, as how the teacher is perceived uh, beyond their you know, role of you know, teaching. Excellent. I absolutely, I'm sorry, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, both of those were great points. Um, that is true that like you learn obedience at home and then in school. Um, I guess a point I'd like to add, um, I think a large difference is uh, the freedom of forming opinion. Um, largely back home, you are, you are taught and you're not giving like a lot of um, flexibility to, you know, like make up your own opinion or like you know, have your, have your own thought. It's more about like, you know, studying. And I feel like also inclusive education. So back home, they don't really like, there's, it's not very prevalent, the idea that each student is different and they have different needs. And like one student might have ADHD or another student, you know, it's not like one way to learn. So I think here there's more like, diverse learning methods of where like it could tailor to each child. Excellent, thank you very much, wonderful. Okay, I think we are ready to move on to the next question. Again, I'm going to encourage our um, participants here today that are with us in our meeting to go ahead and ask any questions or put any comments maybe that you might have, go ahead, put them right in the chat for us. Um, We'd love to hear what you're thinking as uh, our panelists are answering, are answering our questions. Okay, so moving on to question number two. What is one thing that you wish your teachers had known about you? This one is really personal to me. May I go first? Absolutely. I really, really wish that my teachers, ESL teachers when I first came to this country, understood that my ability to speak English is not associated with my intellectual level. Um, or me not being able to speak English have nothing to do with my intellectual, you know, uh, just, just my, you know, just my understanding in general. And oftentimes I was really frustrated when things were dumbed down to me uh, in a sense of, you know, you don't understand the concept instead of you don't understand the terminology. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, also, the other thing that really kind of frustrated me when I first came here is how little faith uh, my, you know, ESL teachers had in me to overcome challenges. So it seemed like they really thought I couldn't do homework or I couldn't work harder. Um, I was ready with the mindset that I'll take on any challenge it takes, whatever, I'll do it. But then the challenges weren't really challenges to me. Um, so that kind of made me think, oh, education is really easy in the U.S. instead of really understanding that my teacher doesn't have faith in my ability to do the work. And those are two different things. Uh, one sets you up for success and the latter sets you up for failure. Okay, thank you for that. 
I I just totally agree what he's uh, what he just mentioned that a lot like wh when I first came here I got a lot of help in the beginning uh, which kind of give me a thought about how like the school was way and much easier than back where I'm from so I thought that I did not need um to try my the best the best I can. So when, as soon as I got, I got into the college, I immediately understood where I was alone and I had to do everything by myself. So giving a little bit challenge to the new students coming uh, to the to United States or joining ESL classes, giving, I would say, give, letting them be independent more and letting them try to figure out by their own and let them struggle, that would help them to understand and learn faster. That's very interesting. I have to say, let them struggle. Um, that kind of resonates a little bit with me. And I'm sure it kind of resonates a little bit with every ENL teacher in some way. Um, I guess that's how we grow, right? Through that struggle. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I actually have seen this working with um, Buffalo Public School children um, who are refugees uh, under five years and um, like some of them would have you know like dreams about like going to a certain school or like just certain things that they want to achieve and I feel like by challenging them and by believing in them you instead of just saying like you know like it's going to be like way too hard for you to like get in the school or like you know try to do this one thing I think I've learned that um they are just as smart as everyone else. And, and it's just like, language is just a means of communication. Um, and like, it, it's equally hard for adults as it is for kids, but it, it really does like, the struggle is almost like, just believe that they can accomplish it, believe that they help them achieve their dreams instead of like, pull them away from it and tell them like, it's harder for you especially to do it. And you have to, stay within this box of where people like you um, end up. Okay, if that, if that like makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you for that perspective. Um, I'm gonna take a question from the chat at this point because it's relevant. Um, one of our, our teachers asks, how can I impress upon young students who are newcomers that they need to work harder on their English? What's a culturally appropriate response, especially as a woman speaking to a young adult male? If I may um, answer to that, um, one thing that really resonates with a lot of uh, young boys and men um, of color, particularly the ones who come from the Middle East, is that we have this shared culture of um, it seems like uh, our our boys skip, you know, the time of their lifetime where they're just being kids and boys. We go from like toddlers to men. Um, how that works is just, I suppose, it's just the culture, you know, element of where we come from. And one thing that really resonates with a lot of um, young boys and men uh, in that stage of their lives is understanding and helping them understand that the better your English is, the harder you work. Uh, the more uh, you'll be able to empower your family and your parents. Because oftentimes what we may not know is that child, that student is actually the interpreter for the family. So, hey, when you know more English, you're making less mistakes. Not only are your grades getting better, but you're helping your mom and your dad and your siblings and their doctor's appointments or whatever the case might be. Um, so that might be one incentive. Another incentive might be just jobs. Hey, you speak better English, you get better jobs. Even before you get to college, you're able to have better opportunities, internships. Uh, incentivize it that way. That's definitely one thing that drives uh, young boys and uh, men of color, um, at least, again, Middle Easterns. Anybody else want to take a stab at that one? I definitely agree um, with Daram. I feel that it's important to tell them the reason why it's so important. And if they know they're on that road of success, that is so empowering, along with helping parents to 
because that's huge. It's, it's okay. huge. I think also understanding um, the trauma they've been through. Um, from my experience working with refugee kids in schools that um, a lot of the teachers like or the educators, I feel like it's not easy to be informed on like global issues or, th or things that people go through abroad. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot to like take time and understand this information and, and, and there's so much going on. But I feel like understanding their special case and the trauma they've been through and like showing them that, that you have this understanding is that could contribute so much into them gaining trust for you and understanding that you have their best interest at heart. Um, and so it will like, it's almost hard for them to disappoint you as an educator because there's this element of this person believes in me and expects highly of me. And if so, I, and, and they understand me, they try to know where I come from and what I've been through. And that alone will give them like, I don't want to disappoint my teacher. I want them to be proud of me. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there is a, another question in the chat um, relative again to the same, to that same question. Um, but we'll take it after this one because it kind of feeds into this one too. So this question is, what's one thing your, you wish that your teacher had done differently from the beginning? Well, uh, for me personally, with my ESL teacher, um, everything she has done, it was great. And I'm really thankful for what she has done. Um, to be honest, I would say there was nothing I wish that changed because everything she has done for me, it helped me through a lot and everything, even inside the school and outside of the school, because we had a great relationship uh, even as a student with a teacher and also as friends, I would say. And I always had a lot of respect for her, for understanding where I was coming from and what my struggles were. I'll uh, also, I would say, understand my background. Yeah, if I can just add to that, I wish my teacher would have known or understood my background or where I was coming from or um really getting to know who I was um, and it's important for teachers um, to really get to know their students and understand that background because if they understand that background it helps them build and create a relationship with the students yeah I agree with you all on that I think those are really excellent points um and to feed into this is getting to know you is something that, you know, you said was really important. So understanding your educational background is also important. Um, can you give us a little bit of information on your educational background as far as literacy, math, um, from your home country, and then from the United States, if that's possible? That was actually going to be my answer. So, uh, Nicole, thanks for asking that question. Excellent. Um, uh, one thing I wish my teachers have done differently um, was actually to do some research prior to working with all of us students from different countries. Because there is this idea that if you're Middle Eastern, you come from this cookie cutter that you're all sharing the same values, same background, same knowledge. And that's just not true. Um, for example, if, uh, if I was an ENL teacher and I'm working with different students from different Arabic or Middle Eastern countries, the first thing I'd look up is um, how is that education system in that country? Um, so if I have, for example, students from Yemen, students from Iraq, students from Jordan, looking into that, well, what does it look like for them coming you know, from those different backgrounds? And if uh, you do a little research, you'd know that, for example, Jordan um, has some of the best education system in the Middle East when it comes to uh, whether it's math or Arabic, uh, not English, because I remember I came with no English. But otherwise, um, they had a lot of very strong system. So when I came in, I was learning 
um, what was it? I think uh, like pre-algebra, not even algebra, um, as a ninth grader, uh, when in the previous year before I came to the U.S. in eighth grade, I was doing pre-calc. Um, so I like came here and I was like, oh, I, yeah, sure. I learned the stuff in fourth grade, uh, but here I am in ninth grade trying to learn algebra. Um, it made no sense to me and I couldn't even communicate that with my teacher. Um, so doing some research, you're going to be able to cater to the need of the student rather than the need of your lesson plan. So that's an excellent point. Thank you. Same question um, for the other panelists as well. Dalshad, would you mind sharing your experience? Well, I would say the math, uh, for me, math was really easy, to be honest. Since I, my, I, was, I was really good at math where, uh, since I was a kid. So coming here and all math is to do with numbers and algebra and calculus, I already have done those like in my past. Um, the only thing like I would say I struggled with math is when when the questions came to um, like asking a lot of questions, not based on numbers. That was the struggle. But anything has to do with numbers. It was really easy for me to do. So it, math and math was really like one of the easiest classes for me personally. OK, great. What about. Um... I guess my question is, what kind of gaps um, did you experience coming to the United States with math and literacy? I know um, that Durgham had count, you know, had commented on that he was doing pre-calc and then came here and did intro to algebra, right? Very uh, pretty basic stuff here, um, but it's a big difference between what he was doing in Jordan in versus, you know, coming right to the United States and, and having that experience. So what did you experience as far as those kinds of gaps in your education coming from one country to the next? Well, I'm going to try to explain this, but I'm not sure how I'm going to explain this, but I'm going to try my best. So for, for me, when I was a sixth grade, I already finished algebra. And I uh, when, I, when I left Syria, I was ninth grade. I, I already finished my ninth grade. So I left the Syria, I moved to Turkey in 2015. Then I moved to United States. Uh, even though after, after the not going to school for two years, I still found math really easy for me. So honestly, there was no, no struggle for me. Anything had to do with math. But other, but then like when it came to science, uh, and when it came especially with for like scientists, uh, how do how would I say like science words or scientific words or something like that? That's when like it kind of like I, it was really hard for me to understand them to understand it. So science uh, was one of my struggles for me personally. Thank you for, for that explanation. Um, and that's something that we do encounter. We encounter students that have had interrupted formal education. Like you mentioned, Dalshad, you know, you, you mentioned that you didn't go to school for two years, yet when you came to the United States, math was still easy for you. So you didn't lose that knowledge. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that. Um, thank I you very also, much. N Nicola, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, um, about this uh, quote, I think it's by Einstein, if I'm not mistaken, uh, something along the lines of, uh, if we judge uh, a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it's going to live its entire life thinking, you know, it's, it's stupid. Uh, but I think this is just to acknowledge that there are many forms of intelligence. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me because um, I moved to different school districts when I first came in here. And I just saw how, you know, when you have uh, a school with high volume of English language learners, it seems like the only measure of intelligence is your ability to, ability to speak fluently. Um, and I remember as a student, I believed that um, when I was at Grover. When I, whenever I see a student who's able to speak English fluently, I didn't care what their grades look like. To me, they're like super smart already. Um, but then I went to a different school um, and then I saw that, you know, suddenly 
different teachers, different approaches were paying attention to, hey, how are you as an artist? Um, and for example, my brother is a phenomenal um, artist. And like everybody, he'd walk around the hallway, people would praise him and people would point at him. And like, he didn't even understand what kids were saying, but they still acknowledged him for having something special. Um, and I think that's something that we ought to pay attention to. It's what other forms of intelligence exist out there. And it doesn't just have to be, you know, pen and paper. Um, just kind of look deeper than the skin and try to understand these students. And Hodger brought up a really, really good point our students come with different trauma. Um, it's, it's just impossible to look at that student and assume what you see is what you see. Uh, there's a lot of things that students uh, you know, are unable to share with you, whether it's a language barrier or it's the trauma in itself that's kind of suppressing that feeling down and they're unable to share it, especially, um, and Hajar, tell me if I'm crazy here, but we come from cultures where it's, it's uh, kind of suppressive as far as feelings. I can tell you as a man, uh, you know, as a Middle Easterner, uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to talk about my feelings, you know, and I'm not supposed to cry and I'm not supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And that's just things that we have to adapt to and, you know, overcome over time. So, you know, our teachers needs, they need to be that support that we fall onto when we need it. Uh, so I, I, that's just my you know, point of view. Great. Hey. Um, I've seen like kids who um, behind their backs are called like they're dumb or they're like they're they're slow um, because of like their traumas and they would be like really young. Um, I think a really good point also Dalshad has brought up was um, gap years. So like a lot of our refugee kids um, spend years in camps without schooling. Um, and not only is that traumatic because of the weather, because of the conditions, because like you can't even get to, you can't access healthcare, you can't like get a washing machine, like just the simple stuff. Um, not only is it traumatic, it, you, you don't even get the right of education as a child. And what Durgham said about like emotional expression is definitely true. It is true that Middle Easterns are like emotional people, but at the same time, it's like, a lot of the emotions, like whether it's mental health, whether it's trauma, you're supposed to like swallow it and continue with your life, especially with men. Um, to be a man is to suppress your emotion. It's to, you're a man, you're not supposed to cry. You're a man, you're not supposed to like be in pain essentially. But um, I guess with also the conditions that are in the Middle East, even if your country isn't super affected by it or like to a degree, each each country is like relative, right? Each country has its own story. Um, there's so much you go to go through as external factors, whether it's government, whether it's war, whether it's famine, no matter what it is. And then you have your own issues at home. It could be anything. Those could be abuse, alcoholism. It could be anything else. So you have like both to deal with and because there's so many things bigger going on, those little things remain unacknowledged. And even the bigger things, you, you're just like someone else experienced that. I just have to like go through it, I guess. Yeah, that's, um, that's very interesting. Cause oftentimes uh, I know from my experience in the classroom, um, we often do restorative practices. So this kind of leads into this question uh, here and then we'll follow up with the one in the chat. So what is one thing that your teacher did that was the most helpful to you? And this doesn't have to necessarily be your ESL teacher. It could be any teacher that you had. Um, what is one thing that really sticks out for you in your educational career um, that a teacher has done um, that was really impactful and helpful to you as a learner? I think just showing the kindness between two human beings, I think that was huge for me. I, um, my social studies teacher always made sure that I was on the right page, always made sure that I understood uh, and I love social studies just because of the the kindness he um, he presented to me. He was so wonderful. Uh, he's my next door neighbor. 
<laughs> and it just talks it off. So every time I see him, he may just makes me love education and working with kids and just the kindness that we have to show um, to the kids because it's huge. You know, that's the, the tone that a teacher sets for the students as they walk in. So that's what I would say it would be my answer. Also, one thing that um, I, uh, one time I was talking to one of my teachers, um, and then he also mentioned to me that you're here for a reason to study. So school is for studying, obviously. It's not to have fun. Uh, and also, it's not only to pass pass your classes. You need to learn. And that's one thing that we always, back where we're from, it's not about just passing the classes. It's always been about being the, getting the highest grades and to we always had the idea to make our parents proud, no matter what we have done, and to take care of them. And being at school, we always wanted to do to get the best grades as possible as we can. And one of my teachers also, like uh, he mentioned to me, he was like, "Hey, you're here for a reason. You might as well give it all you can and do it, do as much as work you can. Do not give up, and you're here for that reason." and also make your parents proud. And also, by the way, he also was uh, Egyptian. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to bring up a question that was in the chat uh, to go along with this here. So like I said, we often do some restorative practices um, or you know, restorative circles where they're asked to share. Um, how, how is that best, I guess, um, presented to a young Middle Eastern male, for example? Um, and I know even some females that are sort of reserved in sharing, um, in a group setting. So what's the best way to approach that? I think getting to know them is huge. Um, I think it bring, breaks down barriers and once that understanding um, starts up, it just grows between teachers, students, I mean, the teacher and the student and among other students also. Um, go ahead, Hazard. No, I insist. Okay. Uh, I was just gonna say um, that I guess with with dealing with trauma a lot of the times people don't even especially kids like wouldn't even recognize um that what they've been through like carries that weight um so i think to tap into that um like arwa said it requires conversation um and trust and then trying to like not very directly because like like i said sometimes you develop a tolerance of what you go through that you don't even recognize that it's anything special. Just kind of like how domestic violence goes, sometimes you're not even aware. It's like a lobster being boiled. It thinks it's swimming and it has no idea that it's gonna be like eaten eventually. So I feel like it's just like creating that awareness within the child themselves to recognize like what I've been through is that and it's okay and I can grow from, from that. Thank you for that response. Excellent. Okay, so moving on to a new question. What was your favorite school subject and why? If I could take a stab at this one and tie this with uh, the previous question as well. Sure. So uh, interestingly enough, actually my, uh, the the one thing or the thing that I learned, the teachers I learned most from uh, were not actually my ENL teachers. Um, and I really don't want to sound any type of way. I love my ENL teachers. I'm still friends with all of them. We're still in touch. But it was different challenges that pushed me and taught me more than anything else. And I still remember a Mr. Jones, the history teacher, um, who I remember put me in a very interesting position that made me work a lot harder than I thought I ever would. Um, and during history class, he would, you know, teach whatever the lesson is. And then he'd look at me and be like, hey, Durgam, now you learned history in Jordan. 
did that part of history sound the same to you when you were back home? Because history is perceived differently based on which side of history you're on. Um, and as the saying goes, history is written by the winner. So it, it, it was very different. And oftentimes I found myself acknowledged for the experiences that I come with. So that was one, so acknowledgement. Um, and why it happened, it was in history class. The second part was uh, my English class actually uh, with Mr. Maxwell. And I remember I still, that was, uh, let me see, 10th grade. I've only been speaking English for like a year and like a month now. And Mr. Maxwell comes in and says, oh yeah, here is a book. I need you to read it and come in a month and write two page summary of this book. Now think about where I was as an ENL teacher who's been speaking English for just one year. And I was supposed to read Death of a Salesman and summarize it in two pages. Let's all be real, that was too much all on the same page, yeah? But I like the challenge. I read it once and it didn't make any sense to me. And then he, I came back to him. I was like, I can't even write a paragraph. He's like, that's good. That's what I expected. Now read it one more time and let me know what you think. And I read the same book four times in one academic year. And by the end of the year, I came back to him with my two page essay. And by the way, it was not an assignment asked you know, by the you know, uh, of me as a student, but it's something that he thought of. And let me tell you, as someone with a master's degree right now, the biggest accomplishment I've done as a student in academia was that two page essay. And I still think that's the most valuable and creative work I've ever done in my life, so. <laughs> what an excellent story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, all right, let me just take a quick look here. Who else would like to answer that question about your favorite school subject? So I kind of answered it already. My favorite subject was social studies. And the reason why I loved it was the way that my um, social studies teacher, Mr. Kara, um, presented it. He made sure we were on the right page. He asked us questions to check for understanding. It was just a great feeling to be in that classroom and uh, it made me develop that love for social studies. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, on to our next question. Uh, what activities helped you to get through any academic difficulties you had? Maybe sports for me, um, it, I really used it as a tool, as a you know stress coping mechanism. Um, but there's a lot that comes with being an ENL teacher coming to a country that you don't even understand the language, the culture, the norms. So I did go through some form of depression at the time. But again, uh, I come from a culture where depression is not even acknowledged. Um, and I'm speaking for self here. Um, so it was really tough. And I used sports to kind of put all that you know, heavy lift on, and it did help me a lot. That's great, thank you. I totally agree with him. Before I, I before I even moved here at age fifteen, I actually have never heard of depression. I would say, and I didn't even notice that thing that exists till I actually moved to here. And when I started going to school for first, first year and second year. Yeah, I was that type of person that I, I had never felt comfortable like just going out to people and speaking at the beginning because I was really shy. But after my, after two years, I started uh, joining sports, soccer teams, and getting a job on which that kind of made me busy and, and make me think like forget about whatever I was struggling with and going through also overthinking, I would say. So the, like sports and jobs and um, I would say making myself staying busy with a lot, of, taking a lot of classes, especially with uh, uh, hard subjects in the school, that kind of was difficult. It, get, it stressed me, but it also made me forget about other issues that that would, would like lead to depression. Great. Um. If we have time, I had a really great teacher, probably one of the best that that really like changed a lot in me. And um, 
what he did was make the whole class actually write like weekly journals, but he said to not be academic. It has to be like all about your life, what you enjoy. Tell me something like, even if you enjoyed like a cup of coffee this week or like a lunch. Um, this same teacher uh, made my confidence and, and grow in like my, my like depression and all that like wither away by teaching me a lot. Um, he would conversate with me with something outside of class, which was philosophy. He noticed in one of my answers to a questions that I've been reading philosophy. And so he would like talk to me more about different philosophers. And he told me, how about um, we're doing international model UN this year? How about you hop on it? And like, do you, you like lead the group and all that? And I had absolutely like no faith in myself. And he was like, no, we'll sit down together. All of us, like, we'll talk about different issues around the world. Like, so like, I guess, making our voice heard or helping us like find our voice was a really big thing for me um and it taught me that in the long term to like really speak your mind and like so I guess valuing what a child has to say and 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 really getting into their mind and what interests them that's an excellent point thank you and there's a comment in the chat um, that I'm going to mention, and it's right on. It sounds like it was the teacher that made you like your favorite subject, not the actual subject itself. So I think that that's a really excellent point to make. Um, okay, we are moving right along here. And there's one more question. Yeah, there's one more after this one. Um, but this question is really important. Uh, especially now, I think. What impact did the U.S. education system have on your religion and or your culture? What a question. That's, that's like a presentation in its own. Um, I'll try to be brief, and it's really hard to be brief with that question. Um, but I think one of the things the education system in the U.S., have done for me is that it made me challenge the biases that I came with. Um, I was born in a country where uh, a different uh, sect of Islam was the dominant sect. And then I moved to Jordan where it was another sect of Islam, it was the dominant sect. And I kind of always moved around with different uh, religious ideologies floating in my mind. Um, but when I came to the US, being exposed to even more made me take the time to actually understand who I am and explore my religious beliefs, only to make me stronger and believe more in what I believed in, but understand it from a different lens. And that's really important. As far as culture, um, this is something I'm really thankful for many people, like Jenna, for example, who work in programs that support parents uh, in helping them retain that culture and the language. One of the things that I panicked, uh, I remember when I first came in here, is that I was so focused on learning the language of English, I was almost starting to forget my native language of Arabic. Uh, and I love the language of Arabic. I, I've always been passionate about it. Um, so I didn't realize this until a couple of years after moving in here that I was slowly starting to lose it. And that's when I panicked and I began to read and educate myself even more. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like the U.S. education system had pushed me to be uh, more well-rounded culturally, religiously, and linguistically. Thank you for your answer. Um, there's a question in the chat. From a cultural perspective, is the experience of acclimation to the U.S. culture different for men and women from various countries in the Middle East? And if so, in what ways? If nobody wants to take a stab, but I see Arwa. Arwa, please. Um, you know what? I forgot. I, if you can um, um, tell us the question again. Sure. So the question comes from the chat. It is, from a cultural perspective, 
is the experience of acclimation to the U.S. culture different for men and women from various countries in the Middle East? And if so, in what ways? Oh, it's definitely um, different. Uh, um, say, for example, in Yemen, um, it's more conservative, conservative more um, religious-based uh, as opposed to like the the United States, where it's more liberal and um, things like that. Women in the Middle East or in Yemen are more modest and things like that. So, Durham, you want to add? I, I see Hajar also with a smile on her face. So I know Hajar has plenty to add. Hajar, would you please yeah. go first? Ed. Um, sure. I, I think it's a really interesting thing for, for coming from a woman. Um, to grow up in the U.S. after have growing up and have grown up in the Middle East. Obviously, the Middle East um, varies in culture. Each country is different, with the common denominator of them having like the Arab lang the Arabic language, um, and and the a lot of shared things. But um, from my personal experience women where I come from um, aren't really told that like, hey, you're going to grow up to be whatever you want to be or like, hey, you can you can really like work to be this or that. It's more like you're going to be a beautiful bride one day. And um, that really like gets into girls heads of where this is where they see their potential um, and they don't strive for more like academically or career wise. Um, I think that's like part of it and 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 there's like plenty more of where you come here and like Arwa said that it's more liberal and whatnot in a good way because you come here and you can mix the the beauty of your own culture and then be who you really are you can pick and choose whatever you want to be or like it, it helps you with your growth process I guess with little kids though it's interesting because the parents would probably still have the mentality of back home, the expectations of back home. Um, and I see it a lot with parents here and not to ever debunk their beliefs, they're always respected. But I guess allowing a woman to really explore what she wants to be and, and have her own dreams is super empowering um, in a way that doesn't offend the parents, I guess. But um, I think it's something that we could really like empower our women with. I think the biggest way you can empower a girl uh, who's Middle Eastern is education, a hundred percent, any girl in the world, but with like, with the, with that culture and the weight of being obedient to your family and the weight of having to like, you have to follow certain, certain things, family customs, um, but with that, you don't want your character to deteriorate in the process. You still want to build character. You still want to have a voice. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing that the U.S. could, could teach and, and, and teachers and educators like you guys could um, really enforce. Great. Thank you so much. So um, we had you touched a little bit on biases and some cultural norms and things like that. Um, so this question is, kind of fits right in there. What are some misconceptions that may have been made about you, either as a student or as just a person from the Middle East in general? So one mis misconception that I can identify with is uh, not being able to follow my dreams or be able to become whatever it is I um, would like to be. Uh, for example, I got my educational leadership certificate and degree and a person asked me how um, the males in my family thought, what did they think about that? And I replied by, go get it, go for it. Why are you asking me, you know? So just that idea of um, women are oppressed and women um, can't, um, reach their goals and they have to ask someone um, about uh, being able to go ahead or pursue their dreams. 
We have time for about one more answer. I'll be brief. Um, uh, Arwa really brought up a good point and I'm gonna share the story of my best friend who's also from Yemen. Um, and uh, his wife came here after he did uh, by like five years or so. And when she came here, uh, she was wearing the uh, like the burqa, the full cover and all of that. And when she came in here, he was like telling her, hey, you don't have to like cover your face. I'm okay with you if you remove the covering. Um, you don't have to wear the entire, you know, that uh, we call it abaya. Uh, you can wear like long shirt and pants um, if you wish to. If you're comfortable, tell me. And the entire time, and I swear to you until this day, he shares with me that he's constantly telling her, hey, you don't have to cover your entire face. And she's always the one who's pushing him to cover herself and express herself the way that makes her comfortable. So there's this idea that men are suppressing women to cover their face and wear this and wear that. And it's like, did you ever think about them as humans and making choices? Maybe that is their choice. Um, and you just assumed, oh, because she's wearing a headscarf and she's covering her face, she has to. No, that might be her choice as much as it is your choice to show your hair or wear, you know, sleeveless. Um, so that's really something that always, always, you know, is on my mind. And I, I try to kind of advocate for it as much as I could, but it's really good when our teachers keep it in mind. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Well, here we are at five o'clock on the dot. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here today, um, especially a huge thank you to our panelists for sharing all of your experiences and your thoughts uh, with us as organizers in our audience, and I hope that everyone was able to gain something from uh, what we have heard today. So with that, please do not forget um, to sign up for Nice Tea Sol if you have not yet. $15 is a steal for the amount of professional development that you get. Um, and you get to hang out with really cool people like the people you just met and get to know more about all of us as well. Um, also, we have the we have the Nice Tea Sol conference coming up as well. So uh, and proposals are being accepted from now. Um, so uh, think about if there's anything that sparked your interest today. Um, maybe we could have a repeat of, of some of our panelists. So <laughs> that would be excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks to the uh, Buffalo Rochester team and the New York State TESOL um, executive board members who attended and um, all the participants. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Have day. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.